Antichrist is here! Now! How can I be so sure? Let's think about it. Are you on the edge of your seats to hear me name the Antichrist? Well, <laughs> that's not going to happen. Um, we understand so little about the Antichrist, probably because of pop culture. Um, a lot of what we think we know about end times is informed by the culture around us. Let's take, for instance, the words Armageddon or 666 or even Apocalypse. Like when I say the word Apocalypse, most people think like usually zombie apocalypse, right? But <laughs> they think like, ooh, world ending events. But the actual Greek word just means unveiling, revealing. It's where we get the name for the book of Revelation. It's just that the connotation has hijacked the word because of all the judgments that are proclaimed throughout the book of Revelation. That got associated with the word. And now when we hear apocalypse, we just think world ending events. Did you know that the Antichrist is not even mentioned by that label in the book of Revelation? In fact, the word Antichrist is only used five times in the Bible and never in the book of Revelation. It's four times in 1 John and one time in 2 John. And most of the time it's not talking about who you think it's talking about. 1 John 2.18. Here's one of the instances where it definitely is the Antichrist. Little children, it is the last hour and you've heard that the Antichrist is coming. Even now, many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. 1 John 2, 22 and 23. Who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist, who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. So denying the Father or the Son aligns you with the spirit of Antichrist. That means one way to God, all the other ways are Antichrist, spirit of Antichrist. 2 John 1, 7. For many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ is coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an Antichrist. So you see over and over the word Antichrist is being used of people that are being deceived by not believing in Jesus. And then lastly in 1 John 4, 1-4. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus has come in the flesh is of God, and every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist, which you have heard was coming, and is now already in the world. So this is how I can say Antichrist is here now. Because John said it back in his day. So it was there then, it's here now. Now how did this title of Antichrist stick? I really don't know. <laughs> but that's the way it ended up. That's the one that's the most popular. The problem with that though is now we overlook other passages in the Bible that talk about this figure. Other names for the Antichrist. These are just some of them. The seed of the serpent, the man of lawlessness, the prince who is to come, the little horn, the son of perdition. Now, perdition just means a state of eternal punishment and damnation into which a sinful and unpenitent person passes after death. This title was actually used of Judas Iscariot by Jesus in his prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. John 17, 12. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me, I have kept. And none of them is lost except the son of perdition that the scripture might be fulfilled. So Judas was a type of Antichrist. Now the main passage I'm going to be looking at here as I deal with this Antichrist spirit is Revelation 13. Now the key thing to remember about studying the book of Revelation is there's a promise in the third verse of the first chapter. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and those who who keep the things that are written in it, for the time is near. So there's a blessing when you study Revelation. And I think I know why this is. It requires a lot of decoding. You have to be flipping back and forth all throughout Scripture, in every book of the Bible, to find 
where these symbols and visions have been spoken of before so you can understand what they mean. Now, one of the big points I want to get across here is that the Antichrist is usually thought of as one person, but actually he's a duality. There's actually two people, two beasts, and even the beasts themselves aren't always speaking of just a single person, but a conglomerate, an empire. So this is Revelation 13, 1 to 4. Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world marveled and followed the beast, so they worshipped the dragon who gave authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? There's a lot of symbols in, in this passage. I'm not going to decode them all. That's for you to think about. But, metaphorically, the sea is usually used as the nations. So out of the nations will come this new empire. And there's animals mentioned here, lion, leopard, bear... These are previous empires that will all kind of be rolled up together into one. So the beast is a kingdom, but also a leader comes out of it. We can cross-reference this with Daniel 7. Daniel 7, 7 and 8 says, After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong, and had a huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it. It had ten horns. I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them, before whom the first three horns were plucked out by the roots. And there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking pompous words. And then you go back to Revelation 13, verse 5, And he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and he was given authority to continue for forty-two months. Then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, those whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And then again, we'll cross-reference this with Daniel 7, verses 21 and 22. I was watching, and the same horn was making war against the saints, and prevailing against them, until the Ancient of Days came, and a judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High, and the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. Now again, I'm going to remind you, here we see this beast is able to make war against the saints and prevail, but Jesus promised that his church would prevail, that the gates of Hades would not prevail against them. So what we're dealing with here is a different group of saints. When this beast shows up on the system, it's not going to be plainly obvious to everyone what this is about. Because 2 Corinthians 11.14 tells us that Satan transforms himself into an angel of light. He comes in deceiving. It's going to creep in slowly. He's going to look like this nice, bright, shiny leader that has the answer to all our problems, whatever they may be at the time. Everyone always thinks they'll know what the problems are, but could anybody predict what would happen this year? I don't think so. So we don't really know how it's going to play out, but we know deception will be involved. Daniel 9, 26 and 27, it says, And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end of it shall be with a flood till the end of the war desolations are determined. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering, and on the wing of abomination shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. Now when you study out this prophecy known as the 70 weeks prophecy, you realize what they're talking about here when it says making a a covenant for one week. It's not talking about seven days. It literally says 77s. The sevens, think of it like when we say decade. Decade is 10, and it's 10 years. So this week is a week of years. So we're talking about seven years. So 69 have happened. Messiah was cut off. He died on the cross. And now we're in this gap of time waiting for the clock to restart. 
And it'll start when the prince who is to come, who we commonly refer to as Antichrist, confirms a covenant. What does that mean? I don't know. And neither does anyone else. It doesn't mean he signs a peace treaty. It means he confirms a covenant. It could be something that already exists and he strengthens it. It could be drawn up by someone else and he just makes it happen. Who knows? But when that happens, these last seven years are kicked off. And it'll probably look like a good deal because he's confirming it with many. Now, when you go throughout the latter chapters of Daniel, you'll see a lot of these prophecies and visions. And many of them have been fulfilled in some part through other nations or other kingdoms. And even one guy who was a type of Antichrist, Antiochus Epiphanes. But we know they weren't all fulfilled. How do we know this? Aha! Jesus helps us out here in Matthew 24, verse 15. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Down to verse 21. For then there will be great tribulation such as not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. So there, Jesus helps us out. All the events in Daniel that had been previously fulfilled by a person such as Antiochus Epiphanes, he points to this and says, but it hasn't been fully fulfilled. It's going to happen in its greater fulfillment. This is sometimes referred to as near and far prophecy. There's a near fulfillment, but then... Later on, a greater and complete fulfillment of the prophecy. It's at this point, when this abomination takes place, in the middle of the week, when he sets up this abomination and declares himself to be God, that is when this last period that Jesus calls the Great Tribulation, that last three and a half years, the last 42 months, that's when that starts. And he shows his true colors. For the satanic figure that he is. And Jesus says it's plainly obvious if you've read this passage. But ultimately, this beast doesn't fare well. In Revelation 19:20, when Jesus returns, it says, Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. So let's go to the second beast, Revelation 13, 11 to 15. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. So, dealing with these two beasts, there's a political aspect and a religious aspect. This religious aspect really comes forward in this second beast, because he points to the first beast, and says, worship him. Much like the Holy Spirit points to Jesus and says, worship him. Now, the rest of this passage will go on to talk about the mark of the beast, but I'm going to table that for another video. It says, two horns like a lamb. It's gentle like a lamb, but speaks like a dragon. That's deceit. He looks one way, but acts another. In other parts of scripture, he's referred to as the false prophet. You see this in Revelation 16, 13. I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. Also, you can see this in Revelation 20, 10. The Bible has a lot to say about false prophets. 2 Corinthians 11, 13 to 14. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. 
Matthew 7, 15, Jesus said, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. Interestingly, how he describes the false prophet as coming in sheep's clothing. And we see the ultimate false prophet coming like two horns of a lamb. You know, cute little sheep. Ah. <laughs> Jesus also said in Matthew 24 during his Olivet Discourse in verses 23 to 25, Then if anyone says to you, Look, here is the Christ, there, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. And again, just like this first beast, his end is the same. Revelation 19:20. Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. So the Bible's full of warnings to watch out from deception, to repent now of sins, so that you don't go through this time of trial. Jesus warned about it. John warned about it. Paul warns about it. Second Thessalonians 2. Verses 1 through 12. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. This is the middle of those seven years, 42 months left. He shows his true colors. Verse 5, Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he's taken out of the way. We can see this lawlessness today, can't we? Have you been watching what's going on? Lawlessness is abounding. Verse 8, And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, lying wonders, with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So there you see, this deception will be so strong, it will be God-ordained. Saint will be left off his leash to do whatever he desires. And the deception will be very strong. I've heard people say, I'll wait until all this stuff happens. I'll wait until the Antichrist is revealed. I'll wait until the church disappears. Then I'll repent. Then I'll get my life straight with God. Will you? Will you? I don't think you will. And that's kind of dangerous because how do you know when your last life on this planet is up? You don't. So with all this strong delusion that's about to come, and all the satanic lawlessness that we can already see really striving to push forward and break through. But God is restraining. Now is the day of salvation. Now is the day to repent of your sins, to trust in Christ, and to believe that he will save you. Now is the day to be assured of your citizenship in heaven. I think that's something we should think about.